Good evening, everyone. We're just a couple minutes late starting because we're victims of our own success and the popularity of our speaker tonight. And we're very, very gratified to see uh, such strong numbers here. So uh, I'm going to invite any of the, the youth in the audience to join us up on stage. That is a, a request and an offer, both. So thank you, and we will be beginning in just a few minutes. But there's probably 40 to 50 people out in the foyer that are hoping to get in this evening. Okay, good evening. My name's Matthew Holmes. I'm the Executive Director of the Canada Organic Trade Association. Uh, I've also recently been elected as a member of the World Board of the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements, an organization that's worked very closely with Dr. Shiva and uh, her Navdanya Institute in the past, and, and we are very fortunate to be able to continue that relationship tonight. So to the speakers. I'll first invite Dr. Ian Morrow. He is a Canada Research Chair in Human Dimensions of Environmental Change at Mount Allison. He is also a filmmaker and interviewed Dr. Shiva in 2002 in Edmonton for a film he co-directed called Seeds of Change as part of his PhD focus on farmer knowledge and biotechnology in the Canadian prairies. This research carried out at the University of Manitoba led to one of the biggest academic freedom battles in Canada after the university blocked the release of the film while simultaneously courting Monsanto to relocate their Canadian corporate headquarters to the campus. Morrow has worked extensively with Percy Schmeiser, the Saskatchewan Organic Directorate, and was very involved in the battle against GM wheat. More recently, Morrow has been working with Inuit elders and hunters in the Arctic and co-directed the film Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change with renowned Inuk filmmaker Zacharias Kanuk. So Ian, please join us on stage. And our second uh, part of the conversation this evening is Dr. Vandana Shiva. She is a scientist, and before her more recent work as a philosopher and author, she was considered one of India's leading physicists. An environmentalist, activist, and eco-feminist, she is undoubtedly one of the great minds and most influential women of our times. Her contributions to the areas of organic agriculture and the rights of small farmers to farm and save seed and the truth on the perils of the commodification of food and genetic manipulation are for many the reason why we're here today. She is the founder of Navdanya, an organization that protects biodiversity, defends farmers' rights, and promotes organic farming. The organization has established 65 seed banks across 16 states in her country of India. And it conducts research, provides education, has established the largest direct marketing fair trade organic network in the country while focusing on the important role of women, proving that feminism and environmentalism are truly inseparable, while reaching out to the rest of the world to do the same. And it is with great honor and thankfulness that I introduce Dr. Vandana Shiva. Dr. Shiva, I want to thank you for coming here. This is Mount Allison University, your only stop in New Brunswick on your maritime tour. It's fabulous to have you here. Well, thank you so much, Ian. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you for all of you. <laughs> this is how we sit in India, anyway. 
Yeah, we had a sellout crowd and we tried to get every single person in here like peas in a pod, so <laughs> great. Um, to kick things off, I see every human like a seed. We live in an environment, we have influences on us, and I'm curious, for you growing up in India as a child, what were the types of factors, causes, and conditions that allowed you to germinate into the person you are today? You know, you don't always realize how, uh, how the context and environment for germination uh, shapes you over time. But my parents were extremely unusual. My father had served in the British Army, and then my mother asked him to leave the army, so he became a forest conservator, and I noticed there are many, many forest conservators around. My mother uh, became the first in her community to have higher education and was trapped on the other side of the border when India and Pakistan were split. So she was rescued as a refugee, and she had the option to take on a government job of the same status, which would have been of a higher level. And she said, no, I've done that. I've done everything I needed to do to break the glass ceiling for women, and now I'll be a farmer. <laughs> so literally, my very, my, you know, my childhood was on the farm my mother was building or in the forests. And I remember it's only when I became a teenager, I said, oh my god, you know, all our other friends go to discos, they go to Delhi. And our da dad said, you want to go to a disco? Let's get into the car. And he drove us six hours. And we went into this underground place and dark and seedy, and then we realized, oh my God, the forest is so much fun, the farm is so much fun. <laughs> and in a way, you have to get exposed to this, you know, glitter. And I, I, but I, I think the two things I learned later from my parents, I realized those were the seeds that I'd received. The first was they never said no to us. They lived their lives. And if we had crazy ideas, they said, go do it. And very rapidly, we'd realize now. Yeah. So at a certain point, I wanted to chuck science, because all my friends were doing humanities. And uh, I wanted to change school, and I said, OK. And within a day, I was so bored with history <laughs> and literature, <laughs> I came right back <laughs> to science. Um, I think the other thing that I think is probably the most important lesson because they lived this every day themselves. They said, you, you have to live a life without fear. And to be fearless, you have to have a very clear conscience that guides, guides you on a daily basis. If you are fully aware of doing the right thing every day, there is no power on earth that can make you afraid. And I think we live today in times where creating fear is the political governance style today. And uh, cultivating fearlessness, I think, is one of the most important uh, trainings of democracy and citizen freedom. Mm. Now, you mentioned science. You fell in, fell in love with science as a, as a young person. You went on to study a PhD at the University of Western Ontario here in Canada. And I'm curious what your teachings and learnings and study around quantum physics taught you about philosophy and our natural world? If, you know, I was very impressed by Einstein. And uh, I want you, you know, you, you in, in, impressed by Florence Nightingale, you become a healer, you, you get impressed by various kinds. Or you get impressed by Margaret Thatcher, then that's what you want to become. <laughs> I got very impressed uh, by Einstein, and so I wanted to be a physicist. And interestingly, I went to convents and in convents, they had no science. Um, because the only teachers of that time used to be male, and they didn't want to have male teachers. Then I changed school. I came down to the Herodun, and they couldn't find a higher math teacher. But I taught myself. They couldn't find really good physics teachers, so I'd go off um, to college teachers and spend time with them. Um, and followed, you know, I, I originally trained in nuclear physics, and I was in India's fast breeder experimental reactor in the period it was going critical. And of course, Canada has a very 
intimate relationships with India's nuclear program, you know, the first nuclear power plant in, um, in Baba is called the Kandu Reactor on Canada. Um, and then it was my sister uh, who was tr training to be a medical doctor uh, when I came home for vacations and I'm showing off, you know, being in the nuclear power plant. And she asked me a few basic questions. And I can't answer a single one of them because that's not what we are taught. In physics, all you're taught is how to create a chain reaction. You're not taught about radiation. You're not taught about risks of nuclear systems. And it's become so much more common knowledge today after Fukushima. So I shifted to theoretical physics. And in theoretical physics, you know, you ask questions. And my professors would say, no, 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 just solve the equations. I said, I'm happy to solve the equations, but I don't want to know what the equations are about. So I moved into foundations of physics. That's how I ended up in Canada and uh, at Western. And what the foundations of physics philosophy taught me for everything I do now are two principles. And I think they're very useful principles for everyone. The first is the principle of non-separability. My thesis one was on non-locality in quantum theory. And, you know, in, in mechanical physics, uh, you can only touch that mug by banging against it. It's called action by contact. And quantum theory recognizes you can have action at a distance every, because everything is related. And it's, in ecology, it's called the butterfly effect. You know, in the Amazon, a butterfly can create a storm somewhere else. And we're realizing that more and more with climate change, mm -hmm. that pollution of 200 years ago in the industrialized world, in England, in the United States, uh, melting the ice in the Arctic, in our Himalaya, glaciers are disappearing. So non-separability, interconnectedness, relationship. I think is the most important. And the second is, you know, quantum theory is about uh, non-determinism. That this mug doesn't have just the property of being there, sitting there. It's got the property of having water inside it. Um, everything has multiple values. And, uh, and in the algebra of quantum theory, it's called non-Boolean logic. There's nothing like an either or. Everything is an and. and. And therefore, the polarized dualistic thinking that has been the dominant culture of 200 years of scientific thought, in a way, quantum theory puts it aside and connects us again to indigenous cultures, ancient knowledge systems, the Upanishads and the Vedas, and suddenly you're in a different place. Mm. Now, you're one of the most well-known living environmentalist that this world has ever seen. Some would call you a true tree hugger. <laughs> and I'm curious if you can unpack that term for us, and in doing so, talk about your experience with the CHIPCO movement. You know, I've had articles uh, in the United States that talk about tree hugging as a curse, you know, as something of ridicule. But I was very fortunate. Because my father had been a forester, I grew up in the Himalayan forest. And when I was coming to Canada, I just wanted to visit my favorite spots, you know, carry that memory with me, and I want, wanted to trek in, in the forests and streams. Um, and the forest was gone. It had, the World Bank had helped convert it into uh, apple orchards, which did, did so badly. They've never, ever had up apples. But the oak forests were gone. And it's the oak forest from where the water used to come. So the streams were running dry. And um, in India, we have this culture of, uh, you know, these tea shops on the sides of roads, and they're called dhabas. And they're wonderful places to have a hot chai and talk. So I'm coming back very disappointed to see what's happened, because I really experienced it as if my hand had been cut off, you know? Such a deep part of me. And we'd grown up assuming these forests will always be there, the rivers will always flow. And it wasn't the case anymore. And I'm talking and the Dhabawala tells me, oh, but you know, now we can have hope because there's the Chipko movement. And Chipko means to hug. And women had spontaneously come out in our area 
in, in the central Himalaya where the Ganges starts, um, and uh, said, we are going to hug these trees. You can't cut them. And part of it was they were watching the logging operations create landslides, make their streams disappear. They were having to walk further and further for water, for fodder, for fuel. And uh, they engaged in, in an action which, in my view, is, uh, is the ultimate um, connectedness with nature, love for nature, to say, we will sacrifice our lives. But these trees can't go. Of course, much later, I realized it wasn't the first Chipko in India. I, of course, spent every summer, you know, I, I, even as a student, Every winter, every summer, I'd rush off to India and uh, be there as a volunteer. And what can you do? You know, women know everything. They know their forests. They know their trees. They know the forests are linked to the water. But I had two trainings that the women didn't have. And, um, and it was trainings in, in two languages that are the language of domination. Yeah? If you speak English, you're heard more. If you speak, speak your own native language, it's as if you're not speaking. Your voice is silenced. And the second is, and this is, you know, for me, a joke, that you can write the same thing, and it's not taken seriously, and you turn it into a graph, and suddenly, <laughs> yeah. So I said, I can do that. I know English. I know how to make graphs. And, you know, I started to put out reports. Um, and that, you know, by the time 1981 came, we managed to get a logging ban. The women continued from the early 70s. And it took um, a logging operation in, in a very high part of the Himalaya um, to create a landslide. The landslide blocked the river, Ganges. A four-mile lake was formed. And when eventually the river burst, the flood went all the way to, uh, to Calcutta. Till that time, the theory used to be the most important product of the forest is timber and revenues. And the women were saying, no, the most important products of the forest are soil and water and pure air. And after 78, the government woke up to the fact that the women who'd never been to school were saying something that had to be recognized. And that's how the forests of the central Himalaya in the catchment of the Ganga are today valued and recognized for stabilizing soil and water. And it's now recognized that a living forest has more value than a dead forest. But I was saying it wasn't the first Chipko. Nearly 300 years ago, women of Rajasthan, led by a woman called Amrita Devi, came out. And uh, in this, Rajasthan, as you might know, is a desert. And, uh, They'd had famines before that, and a saint had taught the people 29 principles of ecology. This is so beautiful. Yeah? A religion got created that's called 29 principles, Bishnoi. That's it. Every principle is a principle of conservation and compassion, nothing else. Um, and there's a tree that's very important for the desert ecosystem. It's called the Kejri tree. And that's a sacred tree for the Bishnois. And the king's men came out wanting to chop the trees to be able to fire the limestone for painting the palace. And Amrita Devi said, no, you'll have to cut, cut my head before you cut the tree, because this is our sacred tree. And they did. And then her two daughters came. And they gave their lives. Nearly 250 people gave their lives to protect the Kedri. And in a way, I, I feel so grateful and I feel so humble that it's that tradition that has been my teaching for environmentalism. It's a teaching that is um, about such deep love for the earth that one life not being there is nothing if all of life on the earth can be protected in the process. Now, you're speaking about women, their connection with nature, and you've written extensively on ecofeminism. You've helped to define that entire realm of scholarship. And you have been particularly 
critical of science. You're a scientist, but you've been critical of science. You've characterized it as coming from a capitalist, patriarchal ideology. And you have also linked how these dominant systems subjugate women and ecosystems almost in tandem. And in one of your writings, you talk about how the birth of a child helped you to kind of establish these, these interlinkages and seeing how this oppression is happening simultaneously. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that. Yeah, I remember I just had my child. And, uh, and around that time, there was all the language of patenting life emerging. And uh, in a way, children were also being treated as objects, as property. Seeds were being defined as new property. Uh, but my thinking on ecofeminism really came out of two recognitions. One is, you know, having worked with the Chipko movement, I realized something's going on here. You know? My dad had been a forester, so I used to read a lot of forestry texts because they used to lie around in the house. And here were women who were not treated as experts, but they knew more about the forest. Um, and they knew about more about the living forest as an ecosystem. The science I'm very critical of is not the science that understands relationships and connections. You know, quantum theory is still a discipline that inspires me. The new biology um, of complexity, of self-organization, very deep inspiration. Um, it's the crudeness of a reductionist science married to commerce. That is what I'm very, very critical of, both because it violates science, it violates nature, and it violates communities and knowledge. And of course, there's so much work done by feminists now to show that what we call modern science has a very, very masculine root. Uh, Bacon, who's called the father of modern science, actually wrote a text called The Masculine Birth of Time and said knowledge so far has been effeminate. And now we're going to create a masculine knowledge that will control nature, dominate nature, and create objective truths. And objective for them was that which could divide. Um, and of course, the whole mechanistic philosophy was evolved. Uh, only that which you can measure exists. But relationships don't get measured. And yet they exist. Relationships amongst us can't, are not measurable. Um, and that trend of a reduction of science married to commerce has led to our current situation, which I think is even more deeply troubling. And that is that, in fact, you have no science anymore. When corporations take off over universities, <coughs> They're not asking university communities to find out fundamental principles of how this beautiful earth of ours works. They're basically telling them, shoot genes into cells with gene guns. There are only two ways you can do genetic engineering. Either use a gene gun or do use a cancer cell to infect the plant. I call it genetic warfare at that level of um, of, at, the, at the genetic level, uh, you don't know what's going on. You're shooting in the dark. It's like I had a gun and I just shot. One in a thousand cases are successful, so they've got to put in antibiotic resistance markers. You don't know what the antibiotic resistance marker will do. Its only role is to pour in antibiotics, see which cell succeeded in absorbing the new GM, and uh, the others die. Now, this shooting in the dark is not knowing. Mm. It's not knowing what's happening in that life form. And because there's such violent uh, tampering with the way the plant itself organizes itself, you then say, no, we won't look. We won't look at what's going on. And it's a don't look, don't see, don't know policy. And it was elevated to the status 
of a scientific principle. And I remember this very clearly because I was very deeply involved in shaping the Convention on Biological Diversity, a UN treaty for protection of species that came out of the Earth Summit. And senior President Bush walked out and said, I won't sign this treaty because we'd managed to get an Article 19.3 on biosafety, on the impact of GMOs on the environment. And he said, I won't let my biotech industry be damaged by any regulatory process. The, he came back, and he used to have a vice president called Dan Quayle. <laughs> and for the young ones, he didn't know how to spell potato. <laughs> But he did know how to spell substantial equivalence. <laughs> and this principle said, a genetically modified seed and food is treated as equal to the non-modified one. Treat it, assume substantial equivalence, and you never have to look. And so the US goes around the world saying, there's no evidence, but they've never looked. And you go to Europe, and the public scientists are doing the research. And they're finding out organ failure. They're finding out. Um, um, immunity collapse, and the little bit of data we have today is because there's an independent public science um, which looks at relationships, which looks at impact. So it's not science I'm against, it's peddling of propaganda as science that I'm against. Mm. Now before we jump into biotech, I'm keen to chat with you about it because that's where I've studied a lot. <laughs> um, but the precursor to biotech, the green revolution. You're in India, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, you know, US corporations, philanthropic organizations, with the new science of breeding technology, a emerging understanding of genetics, create high yielding dwarf varieties. Norman Borlaug is given a Nobel Peace Prize for saving millions of people from hunger and starvation around the world, particularly in the global south. And yet you've been critical of that narrative. You've written about the violence of the Green Revolution as it relates to people, communities, and alternative agricultural systems. Why? Um, I didn't know anything about Norman Borlaug. I didn't even know there was something called the Green Revolution. But I do know that in 1984, the state of Punjab, where the Green Revolution had been applied, had erupted into extremism and terrorism. And uh, that same year, by December, we had the worst industrial disaster where a pesticide plant leaked in the city of Bhopal. Now, 3,000 people died on that night of 2nd December 1984. 30,000 have died since then. In Punjab, 30,000 people died in the extremist violence. So by the end of 1984, I'm saying to myself, something's going on with agriculture that is so intimately linked to violence. Uh, why is this happening? Why do we use pesticides? Why do we build, why does Union Carbide build a pesticide plant? And you know, they actually had an advertisement for that plant they set up in Bhopal. Uh, with, it was like a beaker, you know, science. Beaker pour, pouring a red liquid over a landscape where a farmer is plowing the land with bullocks. And the slogan was, carbide has a hand in India's future. And you wouldn't imagine how, you know, when that advertisement in a way actually talked about the hand they had in India's future, but in a very tragic way. Um, I was at that point uh, doing a major consultancy for the United Nations on conflicts over natural resources. And I knew that even in Punjab, there were major conflicts over river waters, over the building of dams, over the prices of wheat and rice. So when this extremist uh, violence burst, I said, there's a layer below that, and I want to understand it. And uh, they said, sure, go ahead and look at it. So I spent a year researching in Punjab, and half the time my trips had to be canceled because I'd booked myself on a train, and I couldn't reach because the train tracks had been blown up, or I decided to go by bus, and the bus before us had been blown up, and you know it was really the worst form of terrorist violence you can imagine. And I did the study as I, you know, 
I did it in a thorough kind of way. And I, that's when I find out, oh my gosh, there actually was attempts starting from 1952 to introduce chemicals to Indian farming. And in fact, it went even further. The British had tried to introduce chemicals to Indian farming. They'd sent Albert Howard to in improve Indian agriculture. And he arrives in India, finds the soils are fertile, no pests in the field. And as he writes in his book, The Agricultural Testament, which became the inspiration of the modern organic movement worldwide. He says, I threw away my spray gun and decided to turn the pests and the peasants into my professors. And he just learned and studied. And at the end of it, wrote this book about the principles of organic farming, which have guided us. 1952, already they had started to say, let's reintroduce chemicals. But native varieties don't do well with chemicals. They have a problem of lodging. Uh, and basically, you know, they're tall varieties because you don't just breed for grain, you also breed for straw. The straw must go back to the soil. It has to go and feed your animals. It's got to make your thatch on your hut. Straw has many uses, and that's why I so admire Matsunobu Fukuoka, the Japanese natural farmer who wrote a book called The One Straw Revolution. He didn't say the one grain revolution, the one straw revolution. Um, and the reason dwarfing was done by Norman Borlaug was in order to be able to pump in more chemicals so it wouldn't lodge. Um, the narrative, of course, has been this was about feeding the world. The reality has been it was about selling more chemicals. Subsidies were made available by the World Bank. And in the first bit, conditionalities were applied on farmers. If you didn't take these chemicals, you couldn't function. You couldn't get a credit of any kind. And at the end of it, Punjab became a land of just rice monocultures and wheat monocultures with water use so intense that the aquifers are now finished. There are wars over water. A cancer train leaves Punjab because with the pesticide use they have, cancer epidemics are very, very high. Um, the soils are dead. The biodiversity is gone. Punjab is among the states of India that has very high rates of farmer suicides. Um, and if you really look at it, the food basket did not increase. We grew more rice and wheat, but it was grown as a commodity. The farmers would grow it, would go into um, these big storehouses, rot, a million tons every year. Uh, and part of what the t uh, that action that became extremism was about farmers seeking justice. And as they wrote in their declarations of that time, they said, if a community cannot choose what they grow, they cannot decide how they'll grow it, they cannot decide the price at which they'll sell it, this is a modern kind of slavery. Now, I'm sure every small farmer feels that way. But the whole issue was made to look as if it was about religious conflict, and it wasn't. It was about farmers' survival. Uh, since then, of course, I've continued to do the work, and I remember debating um, the head of the Borlaug Institute on Borlaug's death. You know, he passed away last year. And of course, he went on about the millions of lives that have been saved, etc. I said, you know, we've done calculations. We could have grown that kind of rice and wheat with organic methods by diverting that much land to rice and wheat and putting that much water as irrigation to rice and wheat. The rice and wheat increased production can be explained through increased land and water availability, not through chemicals and miracle seeds. So the narrative, of course, has been very well developed. It's a false narrative, otherwise India wouldn't be the capital of hunger. Mm. Farmers wouldn't have taken to the gun if they were doing so well. And the peace prize was given to Borlaug because it was said that we'll commercialize agriculture, we'll make all these chemical inputs available, farmers will be, become part of a commercial setup, they will be so prosperous, they will never get angry, and they'll never take a gun. And this was an alternative to the Red Revolution of China. But in fact, Punjab became a bloody place. Yeah. And uh, it, it wasn't. 
an alternative to violence, it became a source of violence. And now we have the second green revolution, right. biotechnology. You know, I spent a, almost a decade studying that in the Canadian context. Percy Schmeiser, the patenting of life. You know, we have corporations in this country and around the world that own life forms. They own the genetic material of these life forms. They have got basmati rice that you fought for in your home country of India. You know, they own canola in Canada. They own mammals. They actually own genes in our bodies. And you fought so hard for this. You fought so hard in defense of life. And I just would like you to kind of share that battle and what it means to you with this audience. Well, you know, I, because I'd done the work on the Green Revolution, I got invited to a conference on biotechnology in 87, organized by the Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation, which has been set up in Sweden uh, in the memory of the first Secretary General of the United Nations. And um, Pat Mooney um, was involved also in this, uh, organizing this conference. It was on biotechnology called Laws of Life, and the industry was there. And they talked about how they needed to do genetic engineering to get patents. And they talked about how they needed free trade to be able to spread both their, uh, both the, uh, the legal framework of all forcing countries to patent life, as well as be able to acquire local seed companies. And I don't think there is an emergency as big as what we face on the issue of seed related to agriculture. Because most domestic seed companies have been bought up. In India, cotton, we used to have 1,500 varieties. Indian cotton farmers were extremely prosperous. Monsanto came in started to buy up the Indian companies or take, make licensing arrangements with them, pushed its GM cotton, the BT cotton. Farmers got into debt. A new phenomena of farmers' suicide started. And the farmers' suicides have today reached a quarter million in the last decade and a half. A quarter million Indian farmers have committed suicide. Um, but it was just listening to them saying, no, we'll it's not fair that farmers save seed. It's not fair that farmers save seed. <laughs> so you've got to stop it. And so they wrote this whole intellectual property rights agreement, and Monsanto is on record saying, you know, a representative called James en Enyart of Monsanto said after the WTO uh, was established that we've written this intellectual property treaty. We defined a problem, and the problem was farmers save seed, and we offered a solution. It should be a crime. And we were the patient and diagnostician and physician all in one. Um, and to me, this was like a dictatorship over life. I've called it bioimperialism. And that's when I went home and started to save seeds and started Navdanya. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, patterns on life are now there and you can't challenge it. You can't change it. And you might remember there used to be slavery. People thought it was right to own human beings as property, trade in them, and make them work as slaves. Some people think it's all right to define life and seed and genetic material as an invention. It's not an invention, <laughs> you know. You put a gene into a plant, you're not creating that plant. It's like bringing a chair into this hall. And just because you brought a chair or bringing a mat into this hall. Now if you'd carried a mat to sit on the floor and you said, I brought this mat and therefore I'm the architect of this building, I'm the landowner, <laughs> the university should pay me a rent. <laughs> That's what's going on with patenting of life. You know, they put one gene and say, now the plant and all its future generations, and if our GM plant contaminates your field, then even your crop is mine, which is Percy Smyser's case. And in Percy's case, I remember they said, 
If contamination is the way we are going to take control, we are going to spread contamination. But now they've, you know, they've, because the issue was patenting, then they start to patent Indian wheat. We fought that case, fighting a new case where they've patented a new a melon. If you look at the patents on climate resilient crops, they have everything under the sun. You know, if, if you do breeding, you work with one plant over years and you develop a particular trait, or, you know, a resistance to a particular pest. They're, the patterns they're taking are now patterns to cold stress, heat stress, drought, flood, everything in one pattern, and every crop under the sun in one single pattern. Because they know with climate change, there will be more, more value of climate resilient traits, and they would like to be able to collect rents. Now, they've managed to spread the false impression that genetic engineering creates these traits. Genetic engineering has only managed to create two traits, herbicide resistance and Bt toxins. So what they basically do is steal the plants and crops that third world farmers have evolved. In Navdanya, you know, we started to save everything. And then in 99, we had a cyclone in Orissa and the salt tolerant seeds we had saved were able to bring back agriculture. 2004, you might remember the Asian tsunami. And the waves came in three miles. There was salt on the land. The government gave up and said, for five years, we won't be able to do agriculture. And we said, no, we can. We'll bring you salt-tolerant seeds from Orissa. Hmm. And we carried two truckloads from the farmers of Orissa to the farmers of Tamil Nadu. And within a season, they had a crop which did very, very well. Some of our seeds were taken by Indonesian farmers. And actually, the production increased even more. Because sometimes when you relocate, you do even better. Sometimes you do worse. Um, so the, the entire biotechnology enterprise is based on false claims. We've actually done a report recently um, because, you know, the, Indian farmers were committing suicide, and Monsanto's ad said, farmers' pride, India's pride. Bolgard 2. They don't tell you why Bolgard 1 is not talked about anymore, <laughs> because it's not controlling pests. And now they're getting ready with Bolgard 3. And I love to quote Einstein on this issue. You know, Einstein had told us, if um, a clear sign of insanity is to keep doing the same thing again and again, <laughs> expecting a different outcome. You know, three stacks of Roundup resistance genes aren't going to stop creating superweeds. They'll make faster superweeds. So our report on GM, worldwide report, we published. It's available on the Navdanya website. We eventually decided, you know, how much can you labor with scientific titles? So the content is extremely well researched, extremely well supported by evidence and facts. But our title is The GMO Emperor Has No Clothes. Because I think we've got to become like children in that Hans Christensen story to recognize that the emperor is naked. Mm. Yeah. Now, one of the most inspiring things that I've read of yours, but also I had the privilege of you saying to me the last time we spoke 10 years ago, was that your battle to protect seed was inspired by Gandhi and the symbol of the spinning wheel. And I'd really like you to share your thinking on that. So you know that 80, 1987 meeting where the industry is laying out its plan of total control over life on Earth. I'm just thinking, my God, when you have that kind of total power, how do you deal with it? And my mind went to Gandhi. Because, you know, during British rule, 85% of the territories of the world were controlled by that little island nation. And Gandhi took out a spinning wheel because he understood that our colonization was related to the fact that we had stopped producing. We had stopped being producers. Our cotton was being taken to England. Our indigo was being taken to England. Everything was being done under forced cultivation. 
you have the slave system in, in America, also growing cotton, and then a few mills were sending out textiles to the rest of the world. And I kept thinking in my head, what would be the spinning wheel of today? And since at that time the key industry determining imperialism was the textile industry, and today the key industry determining a new bioimperialism is what they call biotechnology, life sciences industry, but basically the control over life, including control over seed as the first link in the food chain. Um, I thought to myself, in the context of this new control over life, the seed has to be the spinning wheel. And I knew nothing. All I had was my parents' library. I'd pull out the books. I'd go off to my old villages in where I'd worked with, uh, as a volunteer with the Chipko movement. I'd go back and say, you know, do you have the seed? Do you have this crop? And bit by bit, collected seeds. All I knew is we have to say it's seeds. And all I knew is somehow we have to do it in a way that farmers adopt these seeds. So organic farming became necessary because you couldn't give these seeds to farmers and expect them to do chemical agriculture. They had to change their mindset. And initially, I would encourage farmers to grow these crops through organic methods on their farms. Uh, and then I realized we have to get better organized about it and we started creating community seed banks. And the reason we call them community seed banks is because the whole idea of patenting life is based on privatization of seed and biodiversity. And we believe seed is a commons to be shared. And it is a duty that we have. So our membership, and we have a network of 500,000 farmers who pledged uh, to this membership, our, our membership is very simple. We basically say, we've received these seeds from our ancestors. We owe it to our future generations to hold these seeds and pass them on in the diversity, health, and richness with which we receive them. We will not obey any law that comes in the way of our higher duty to save and exchange seed. No law will prevent us from doing this. And, you know, our government tried 2004 to introduce a seed law that would make it illegal for us to have native seeds. And we did a seed satyagraha, which is the Gandhian action. Uh, satyagraha means the fight for truth. And it's basically an action to say, sorry, your law is wrong. And I'm really hoping that we'll be able to do this worldwide. I mean, you know, I'm thinking of this whole global campaign on seed sovereignty. But the global campaign on seed sovereignty has to be a combination of, of saving seeds, but not saving seeds in tiny bits, saving seeds through cultivating differently, creating a different kind of sustainable, organic, local food system based on diversity. But I think we need, just like we got rid of slavery, We've got to get rid of slavery of life through patents on seed. And I hope from 2nd October, which is Gandhi's birthday, to 16th of October, which is World Food Day, around the world, we'll be able to take actions to say no patents on seed. We have a higher duty to protect life on Earth, to protect biodiversity, and to pass on living seed to our future. Yeah. Now, you're a movement leader. You're an inspiration to many. And uh, we're at a critical time in this thing called life. We have climate change. We have peak oil. We have a big crunch coming that is going to affect us all. And I think we kind of get caught up in the battles about what's not working. And we get caught in struggles. And they're important. But we also have to redefine a future. We have to create a new vision for the world, occupy Wall Street, the collapse of the economic order as we know it. It's time to rebuild something different. 
And as my kind of final question for you, I, I just would like to kind of kick off uh, the idea of alternatives and how we build them. Where do we go from here? I think the first place we build alternatives is in our minds and in our hearts. Because our minds have been colonized. And the minute you can free your mind, all kinds of possibilities open up. Yeah, if you're colonized to imagine that the only way to farm is with chemicals, you'll keep farming chemically. But the minute you realize working with nature, working with ecological processes, doing organic farming is better for the soil, better for the farmer, better for the eater, suddenly a whole new set of options get created. I think the second thing is to recognize the interrelatedness of the multiple crises. Whether it's the ecological crisis, including species extinction and climate change, or it's the economic crisis, and after 2008, no one can pretend that it isn't there. And the third, I think, is a deep political crisis, a crisis of democracy. Because you know, when, when we started the International Forum on Globalization to deal with the WTO, uh, we defined the process of globalization as, as the establishment of corporate rule. We could see that what this process was doing, it was in the name of free trade, it was made to look like it's about trade, but it was really about who starts to control production and consumption and the natural wealth of this planet. I think in 2012, everyone in Occupy, the indignados in Spain, everyone is so clear that uh, representative democracy has been hijacked by corporate interests. And, uh, and today the state is not acting on our behalf, even though representatives come and get votes. And at the end of it, they don't get instruction from people, they get instruction from the corporations. And this divide, this separation between the will of the people and the will of the corporations is becoming a deep threat to democracy. Uh, if we sit back and watch it unfold, the only one next step, which is a totalitarian state. Using instruments of, uh, of fear, of violence, of control, of defining all actions of a democratic society as extremist, it's happening. Um, You're one. They're, they're you're a radical, they've said in Canada that, yeah, environmental uh, And radicals. the other is to recognize what our fundamental freedoms are and to start to correct these aberrations. To correct them in our collective strength, to correct them with a different kind of vision. And I've tried to articulate this other vision in terms of what I call Earth democracy. And it's not sort of, you know, a worldview out there, but it's connected to everyday actions of people. And I call it Earth Democracy because I do think the next step of human freedom will only come out of a larger freedom for all life on Earth. It's only when we set all species free will the last human being be free. Uh, and so Earth Democracy is about the democracy of life. But it's also a democracy of everyday living. It's not about that ballot paper once in four to five years, because we know it's not making a difference anymore. It is about how we grow our food, how we eat it, how we run our educational systems, what happens to our water, whether it gets poisoned and fracked away and becomes one continuum with oil and gas, or our rivers flow free, our streams and groundwater and aquifers are able to sustain life. Um, and that everyday action, I think, is the most powerful action. That's where, again, I go back to the spinning wheel. And when Gandhi was asked, how can a few pieces of wood bring you freedom? And he said, these pieces of wood bring us freedom because they're so small. Anyone, in those days, you could still make your own spinning wheel, you know? set it all up. Um, this is so small that it can be the ha in the hands of the poorest woman in the smallest hut. So that the last person is relevant to creating freedom for India. 
Uh, we, uh, one of the big things we are told, I remember uh, environmental debate, and um, you know, it's an environmental expert is saying, you know, because the problems are so big, we can only solve them through large responses, and therefore they're only the corporations can solve environmental problems. And I said, precisely because the problems are so big, we have to respond to them at the level of the small, because only the small can multiply enough to be able to deal with the big challenges we have. And that is what I call living democracy. A democracy that's vibrant, where we reclaim the spaces that are the rightful spaces, but not only as rights, but also as our responsibilities and duties. And this then gets connected to creating living economies. That's what has been such a pleasure for me in terms of my travel uh, through Nova Scotia and today here in New Brunswick, because there's such a burst of energy here where people are trying to define living economies in new ways. And it's through these initiatives with a deep awareness of what is the ugly vision of total control that we face, we anticipate, to have one eye on resisting that, but our heart, our mind, our bodies, ourselves, our communities dedicated to building the alternative. Well, on the idea of democracy, I want to get off the stage and let people get to speak with you, and that's kind of what we're having here as a conversation, and, and we'll kind of let people uh, enjoy in that conversation with you, and so I'll turn it over to Matt, and I think I'm going to sit with some of the people back here, so thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Ian. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Morrow, and thank you, Dr. Shiva. That was uh, a wonderful conversation. I was pleased to listen in on. Um, we are going to open this up to questions. Hello, my name is Starchild. I am Mi'kmaq from Prince Edward Island, across the water here. And it's, a, it's an honor to be in your presence. Um, I've been born in 81. I hear you referring a lot to 82 in the 80s. And so I know that you've been in this long, long beyond my, my life span here. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a great honor to be in the presence of your wisdom. And um, I just wanted to welcome you um, as Mi'kma'ki of this land. And also on behalf of, of my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother, my ancestors. I want to take this moment to really give you that grand welcome and also welcome your ancestors and thank you for, for touching your sacred feet onto our land and for sharing this great wisdom because it is very important and I'm so honored to see my peers um, amongst us here and also our elders that are here as well. And so for that, I'm just wanting to gift you with some sacred medicine for our women, our sacred sage, and also a uh, Dr. Irene Novichek, a great mentor of mine, or my water mother, I call her, <laughs> also is gifting you with some sea plant sprinkle. And so we'll all in. Thank you so much. Tony Redden, and I'm from Prince Edward Island. What I wanted to ask is, can we rescue our governments from the corporate control that's uh, such a problem now, and bring them back into uh, activist role to do these uh, things that we need uh, brought back, the democracy for people of resources. Uh, and um, if enough of us get involved in political work, could we not uh, rescue? Our governments. <laughs> no, I definitely think we have to rescue our governments, but we have to stop thinking of governments as, as one centralized location. Government, after all, is many layered. 
It's local, it's regional, it's national, it's international. Uh, and what I'm finding is, you know, the corporations like to be able to have centralized control, so they work through centralized national governments. It's the levels beyond where people have a closer connection and also higher levels of accountability can be experienced. So if you try and understand why is Europe GMO free, it's because regional and local governments started to say we won't have this stuff, along with citizens who said we don't want it. The European U uh, Commission tried its best to bully because there are 80 lobbyists of Monsanto who sit in Brussels. But it's the networks of regional and local governments, and there are 55 regional governments that have got together in a GMO-free network and said we will not accept. But they also are governments who can support alternatives. So they support organic, they support local. In India, uh, we managed to mobilize to stop the first food crop that would have been genetically modified, um, the Bt eggplant. And uh, 13 states we could get on board to say we will not accept this. Five states in India are moving towards organic. Jharkhand, I go and train them. We have two seed banks in Jharkhand. Um, the government of Bhutan. So. We've got to work, from, you know, democracy, in my view, grows from the bottom up. Dictatorship comes from the top down. And since we've got to cultivate democracy, we start building it where we are and taking it upwards. And I just feel the whole fraud of corporate rule is so deep, particularly in the area of food and agriculture. And since this is something we all are engaged in, either as farmers and producers, we are all engaged in as eaters, none of us can say, it's not my business. We don't have an excuse. And we have to shape what I call a food democracy. And interestingly, the Occupy movement has decided tomorrow will be about occupying the food system. They've dedicated tomorrow to awareness about what's going on in the food system. And the second really big advantage, because we have Matt as MT, is that, you know, it's not that we are suddenly finding everything's wrong and now building an alternative. We've got such a legacy of an organic movement. We're now also building local food movements. So I think this is something that if we really stay united, integrated from the seed to the table, from the producer to the eater, Globally, in solidarity, I, I can really see things change very, very rapidly. My name is Richard. I'm from uh, Petit Rocher. And uh, I think uh, one of the most important comments you made today was uh, about cultivating fearlessness. I'd like to uh, hear from you. How did you cultivate fearlessness in yourself? By just being very much at home with your own conscience never doing anything for a petty reason. And once your conscience is your guide, as I mentioned earlier, there is no force, no power that can put fear in you because it all looks so trivial and it all looks so passing. So cultivating fearlessness is really about recognizing the right action, recognizing the good, and dedicating yourself fearlessly to follow that path. And that path is its own reward. There's no re reward beyond. And as Gandhi said when he did his first Satyagraha, it was on a 9-11 in South Africa. And he's talking about not cooperating with this law about identity. You know, they had to carry badges. I'm black, I'm Indian, I'm white. And he said, no, we are all one citizenry. We are all equal. We will not be divided by race. And, um, and as he writes in his book so beautifully, 
He said, you know, the best they can take away from you is your body. Not, they can't really harm you. Um, so the other aspect of cultivating fearlessness is to not have shallow attachment to things, you know, say, oh my God, they could take my house. So? <laughs> they could rob me of my job. I, you know, I gave up my job in 82. Every one of my scientific colleagues has lost their job if they fought against the biotech industry. <coughs> And by now, Monsanto would have got after the university that employed me if I had a university job and I hadn't given it up in 82. Um, so, I, you know, this being dedicated and passionate with your conscience as your guide, the right action as your guide, and then a detachment to know that there is no sacrifice too high. Dr. Shiva, my name is Megan DeGraff, and uh, I also come from a family of foresters and organic farmers. I'd like to ask you a question about the word sustainability, because I think that's a word that has many meanings, and it's open to interpretation. And I would like to know what you think about the concept and the practice of sustainable development. Well, you know, sustainability by itself means sustaining. And one of my big campaigns with Monsanto was when they tried to privatize water. And they actually had a report on sustainability. And the first para said, this much percent of the water is polluted, this many people are without water. Turning this into a commodity is very sustainable business. So for them, it was sustainability of profits. And I had another conversation, this was 84, I was in Africa, and uh, the Horn of Africa had a horrible drought and famine. And I was going there to really try and understand. And there was a person sitting next to me from Pioneer Hybrid, the seed company. And he asked me why I'm going there, I asked him why he's going there, he said to sell hybrid seeds. I said, but they have a drought, hybrid seeds won't do well. He says, for us, the drought is wonderful. The more seeds fail, the more we sell. And there's sustainability there, you know. This, after all, let's not forget that the biotech industry is the same as the agrochemical industry, is the same as the pharmaceutical industry. So if you get cancer, that's fine. Then Novartis sells you a cancer drug that's patented, you know. Uh, that's very sustainable as profit and as business. But the real level of sustainability is at the level of nature. You know? Do ecosystems sustain themselves? Do species sustain themselves? Do rivers sustain themselves? Do oceans sustain themselves? Does the climate system sustain itself? Um, at the level of society, it's about social sustainability. Are our future generations guaranteed well-being and health and prosperity? Uh, Sustainable development gets a bit problematic because development got messed up. Development originally was a biological term. And it defined the progress of a seed into a tree, of an embryo into a human being. And development was internally evolved. And in 1948, Robert McNamara, who became the pre president of the World Bank, suddenly announced that we were all underdeveloped in the third world and we needed to be developed. And to be developed meant that we had to borrow huge amounts of money from the World Bank, get into debt, make them rich. For every dollar they lend, three dollars of business. Um, and development then became this amazing enterprise that was externally imposed, generated big business, but absolutely wiped out our sustainability of nature and sustainability of society. So when you put sustainable development together, you still have all those confusions of development. And the only way we'll be able to have some meaning in that term is if we bring development back to the original meaning. 
which is self-guided for a species, for a community, for a society, for a country. And then sustainability can be put as a measure of are you then having a lasting evolution, a lasting impact to be able to sustain life into the future. <laughs> you're awesome. Okay. Um, so your studies are quite evidently interdisciplinary, and um, I was wondering how you respond to critiques of ecofeminism as being inherently essentialist, um, and what are your strategies um, to sidestep and respond to problems that could arise from an essentialist perspective? Well, my response uh, to those who say ecofeminism is essentialist is uh, that they haven't read. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, when someone like me talks about the connection between uh, ecology and feminism, we are talking about the fact that socially, culturally, politically, women were made responsible for certain activities. I call it activities in the sustenance economy. In countries like mine, they're the ones who have to get the water. So when the spring dries up, they know it's dry. When the groundwater is polluted, they know it's polluted. And so it took the women of um, outside Boston to know that the groundwater was contaminated and the children were getting cancer. Um, so it's cultural, it's political, it's not biologically determined. Just as much as, as the feminine is not just for women. Gandhi had the most beautiful prayer. Every day he would say, make me more womanly. And again, not because of biology, but because of cultivation, it so happens because women were the ones looking after sustenance. They're the ones who've become experts in the care economy. And our grandmothers more than others. Native American cultures, the First Nations. It's, it's about what culture do you carry when you carry a culture of domination and violence, that's where you go. It's not about biology. I don't think men are designed to be violent. I think men have been encouraged to be violent. And I, you know, I know at least five men who are doing eco-feminist PhDs. They see themselves as eco-feminists because they, see the rec they recognize that the domination of women and the domination of nature have the same roots. And I think the whole issue of biological determinism is in fact a patriarchal construct. It was practiced in the concentration cramps and the gas chambers in Germany. And so much of that science, I encourage you all those who are interested in, in the whole biotechnology issue, read a book by Lily Kay, a historian, who went into the Rockefeller Foundation archives. And what she finds is that the scientists who ran away from Germany after the Nazi era where they had tried to practice eugenics, came and now defined a new discipline called social psychology uh, with the assumption that we will find the atoms of biological determinism, and they called it the gene. And they said very clearly, we will now construct biological determinism at a level where ordinary society can't understand. We'll take it deeper and make it more technical. And long before Watson and Crick actually worked out the DNA, the gene was being talked about. So that's how deep biological determinism is. And it doesn't come from ecofeminism. It comes from capitalist patriarchy. <laughs> My name is Najiget. Uh, I'm from, uh, I grew up in Bombay. And uh, the question I want to ask you has to do with uh, education and its role in, as you said, democracy needs to build from the ground up. Uh, because I remember studying about the Green Revolution in India and it spoke of you know, praises 
in my history textbooks. And I was just wondering, I mean, it's only now in university where we can question and write papers and form our own opinions, but for people in countries like India to, to really know what's going on, what the effect of things like the Green, Green Revolution were, and how important do you think that is in democracy? You need democracy, you need information, you need knowledge. And that's why, you know, besides setting up the seed banks, besides doing the uh, practice and uh, education for organic farming, um, one of the things uh, I've started 10 years ago is a school which we originally called the School of the Seed, the Beach Vidya Peet, and now we call it the Earth University, where people can come, learn from nature, learn from community, learn from ancient cultures, learn from the best of new science, and learn in a totally free environment the things that really need to be learned. Um, you know, how many more MBAs are we going to put out to teach people how to be salesmen? <laughs> and we need more people who know how to grow food. Um, and to me, it's extremely encouraging. You know, movements like Occupy, they can see through, they've made a huge political democratic leap. I think political economists are still working out the levels of inequality. And they just said 1%, 99%. And suddenly there's a new political and democratic discourse out there. Um, and that's what we need more of. Namaste, Dr. Shiva. Um, I come from a farming family in Punjab you talked about. My question to you is how would you convince a farmer in India, in Punjab, to go for fa organic farming when we've benefited from the mass production? The only reason I can attend Mount A is because my family could afford to pay for my education after the Green Revolution. And how would you convince a farmer to go organic when none of them, at least as, as far as I know, don't want to? Well, you know, Someone who doesn't want to, won't. <laughs> but the, the way we work with farmers, I mean, I've had farmers from Punjab come to our school for training, and they're like little children. They've never seen a plant of dal. They've never seen sesame. They've seen rice and wheat and now BT cotton. That's it. Um, we show them soils that have been chemically fertilized. And we show them soils that have been organically fertilized. And now, you know, with microscopes and all, you can actually see all the life forms. And anyone who wants to see that he's killing the soil. Agriculture in Punjab today is, for, for the majority of farmers, a losing proposition. Uh, my mother sent me to university <laughs> without the Green Revolution. Um, a typical organic farmer has double to five times higher income. Because the first level is you get rid of all the expenses for purchase seed and purchase chemicals. Secondly, you actually produce more food. We've been told that organic can't produce more, but actually you produce more, especially if you grow biodiversity of crops. And third is you have a better relationship with the market and you get a higher income. Uh, in Punjab, it's just that farmers have got so used to that treadmill. Um, but we work with farmers who are going organic. I work with Prince Charles, who's created a whole new initiative in Punjab called Bhumi Vardhan to help grow organic. And uh, for the widows of Punjab, I started organic gardens. And initially, they were very reluctant. They said, no, we don't, we can't do this. I sent 50 packages of seed. And within two months, I had a request for 300 more. Now, if, if we had a team of 200 people rather than five, I can say we could make Punjab organic within five years. And it will be a more prosperous Punjab without cancer trains, without farmer suicides, without 75% of Punjab being addicted to drugs. You know, that's the rate of drug addiction.
first of all, I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Shiva, for coming and joining us here. Um, my name is Amanda, and I'm a student at Mount Allison. And uh, you've talked a lot about um, things coming up from the local and things coming up from the regional. But you've also talked a lot about the United Nations and things that have come from that level. Um, this week, the Center for International Studies is having a week dedicated to the United Nations, and we're inviting in a former Assistant Secretary General to talk about the re realities and uh, restriction of the United Nations reform. And I'm just wondering, from your perspective, what role the United Nations could play in problems such as this, and what restrictions exist currently that stop them from providing that role? Well, you know, the, the UN has played the role of giving us the only architecture we have at international level, for example, for human rights. It's the only place where we have international treaties to deal with global environmental problems. And I think that role has to deepen. The dangers are that just as our governments are being hijacked by corporate rule, the United Nations is being privatized by corporations. And that's why we have to make, for real, the slogan of the UN, which is the United Nations of the people. And just as much as we reclaim our governments through democratic means to work for the welfare of the earth and work for welfare of society, that same agenda has to go all the way to the United Nations. Because that contest about who, you know, will it be the corporations or will it be people? I think that's the very clear political agenda in every sphere, at every level. Hi, um, I'm Becky, I'm a student here at Mount A, and I'm an international relations student. So I'm really interested in hearing kind of, are you hopeful for the Rio Plus 20? Do you think it's a, a useful organization or method of provoking change, or are you thinking there are other better ways that we can make change on a big scale like that? Yes. Um, you know, Matt talked about Rio Plus 20. Uh, I, I think Rio was a huge watershed because the first thing it did was recognize that we need very serious legally binding environmental treaties to stop pushing species to extinction, to stop destabilizing the climate. And that's why you got the Convention on Biological Diversity and the UN Framework on Climate Change. Um, as Matt mentioned, Rio Plus 20 has been defined as the green economy. And uh, they, it, there's a huge contest. You know, The green economy can be the local food economies you're building here. But the green economy can be the old oil industry, chemical industry, biotech industry, all coming together to predate on the biomass on the world, grab the land of the peasants worldwide, and reproduce the fossil fuel age now using living systems as the feedstock. Now, that green economy would not be very green. It would lead to a lot of violence. It would aggravate every tragedy we face today, whether it is hunger or poverty or thirst. And uh, I think the challenge of Rio Plus 20 is to be able to bring another world view to place. And we must be very grateful to, the, to Bolivia, where President Eva Morales went back after Copenhagen and said, this meeting was supposed to be about the rights of Mother Earth. It has been reduced to the rights of polluters. And I will go back and organize a conference on the rights of Mother Earth and climate change. And then a declaration has been prepared called the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. This is becoming a very big mobilizing platform to realize, my God, we've made a mistake to think the Earth is just dead matter, which is what the scientific revolution tried to say, or it is just a commodity to be extracted, which is what globalization is trying to have us believe. And I think this change in relationship between human beings and the Earth has such huge power that once you've made that change, all kinds of new possibilities emerge. And I think if we're going to have a future as a species, it's redefining that. And I know lots will be happening at Rio. Um, Rio will not just be the government's meeting. It will be the people gathering. 
and people gathering for a new vision and a new commitment has a lot of power. So I have a lot of hope.